Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing finite multiplicative subgroups of a field and trying to prove that they are always cyclic groups. Okay, right. Uh, so, remember the way in which we are trying to prove this is by proving this relative theorem in group theory, which is that if you have a finite group which obeys this interesting property that for any uh, natural number d which divides the order of the finite group, little n, there exists at most d solutions to the equation x to the power of d is equal to the identity element 1, then you are able to conclude, if your finite group obeys that property, that it's isomorphic to the cyclic group uh, of the same order. Okay, so so far what we have discussed is the fact that if you have a finite group which obeys this interesting property, uh, that it contains one and only one uh, Seeloff subgroup for each of the primes that appear in the prime factorization for the order of the group. Further, what we've been able to show is that actually uh, the entire group is isomorphic as far as its algebraic structure is concerned to the external direct product of its Seeloff subgroups, of all of these Seeloff subgroups, which you have only one of for each of the primes in the prime factorization of the order of the group. And what I now want to prove is that each of these uh, Seeloff subgroups within the group capital G is actually cyclic, and then use that to prove that it implies that the entire group, which is the isomorphic to the external direct product of all of its Seeloff subgroups, is actually cyclic. Okay, so we'll begin by proving then that all of the uh, Seeloff subgroups are actually going to be cyclic. Okay, right, so this of course is going to come back to this property, this strange property, um, that for any d which divides the order of the group, there is at most d solutions to the equation x to the power of d is equal to 1 inside your group. That's going to be the crux to proving this. That's going to be the reason that this is true. Okay, so here is the next claim then that I want to show. So, claim. Okay, and it is of course that each of these seed of uh, subgroups that I have, so all of the capital PIs that I have, they are isomorphic to cyclic groups of the same order. So Z and the order, of course, will be little pi to the power of alpha i, because that's the order of each of these uh, Seedorf subgroups. Okay, so this is the claim I want to show you now. Okay, so here we are actually going to use some knowledge from the video on p-groups in the playlist on group theory. Okay, one of the theorems in there we're going to use. Okay, so I'll state the theorem that we're going to use, but I won't be able to prove it here because it takes quite a while. So if you want to see the proof, if you're not familiar with the proof of this, uh, do please go and watch the video on p-groups. So all of these Seelov subgroups, they are of course p-groups. So for uh, capital PI, the order of that is of course little pi to the power of alpha i, i it's a power of some prime number. Okay, and whenever you're working in a p group, you can there is a theorem that we discuss in the video on p groups which says that for absolutely every possible um, size that a subgroup could take on. And in the case of p groups, there aren't that many options. Okay, so the Grange's theorem hugely restricts us to the number of different sizes that subgroups can take on. They can take on the size 1, they can take on the size p. Uh, i to the power of 1, they can take on the size pi squared, pi cubed, all the way up to pi to the alpha i here. Okay, well there is a theorem in the video on p-groups which says that there will always exist a normal subgroup of each of those possible sizes. So in particular what I can find is some capital mi which is a normal subgroup inside of pi such that the order of mi is equal to pi to the power of alpha i minus 1. Okay, so 1 the lower power of pi. Okay, and of course, this is allowed by Lagrange's theorem because this will clearly divide the order of the group here. Okay, but this exists. I can always find you a normal subgroup inside of each of your Seelov uh, subgroups which has order uh, the same prime as is in the order of the Seedorf subgroup to a power one less than it appears uh, in the order of the Seedorf subgroup. 
Okay, right, now, if being normal isn't particularly important to us, the fact is that I have found a subgroup of that order here. Now what I'm going to do is use my strange property, okay? The property that I know that in this group capital G, uh, for any little d that divides the order of the group, there is at most d solutions to the equation x to the power of d is equal to 1. I'm now going to use little d is equal to pi to the power of alpha i minus 1. This is certainly something that divides the order of the group. Okay, what I can now conclude is that there is at most pi to the power of alpha i minus 1 solutions to this equation, x to the power of pi alpha i minus 1 is equal to 1. Okay, now where are all of the solutions to that going to be? Well, of course, they're going to be inside mi, okay, for exactly the same reason as we used earlier on. All the elements in this subgroup of capital PI are going to have to obey this equation. They're going to have to have an order that divides the order of the group. Therefore, if you raise them to the power of the order of the group, of course you are going to get 1. Okay, so all the solutions to this equation have to be inside there. Now let's think about the elements of capital PI that are outside of MI. Okay, so I'll just draw a picture here. Here is capital PI, and inside there is capital MI. Now remember, and I'll just add a bit of colour on here, so here is capital PI outlined in green here, okay, and here is capital MI. Okay, now remember all the elements in capital PI had to satisfy the equation x to the power of PI to the power of alpha I uh, was equal to 1, okay? All the things in capital MI, they satisfy this more restricted equation that x to the power of pi to the power of alpha i minus 1 is equal to 1. Now clearly if you satisfy this equation, you also satisfy this equation. This is a stronger version of this. If you satisfy this, this is just this one uh, times itself, pi times. Okay, if you like, it's just this raised to the power of pi an additional time. Okay, so if you satisfy this, you certainly satisfy this. Okay, um, but now let's think about the elements outside. All of the elements in this portion here, oops, I'll just bring that back into the correct position for the camera. All of the things in PI outside of MI, this portion that I'm now uh, colouring in there in pink, okay, well, these cannot satisfy this equation because of our funny property, because all the solutions to this equation have to be in there, but they do have to satisfy that equation. Okay, so they have to be an element which, if you raise them to the power of pi to the power of alpha i, gives you 1 as the answer, but doesn't satisfy this equation, i.e. their order has to be pi to the power of alpha i, because remember, their order has to divide the order of the group. Their order cannot be pi to the power of alpha i minus 1, so their order must be pi to the power of alpha i. Okay, now what does that mean? That means that I have found you absolutely loads of elements of this group, capital PI, with order equal to the order of the group, equal to pi to the power of alpha i. So take whichever element you like from this portion, that must be a generator uh, of the group. I, if you generate its cyclic subgroup, it must generate the entire group, hence this group must be cyclic. So that's how I can conclude that all of these c uh, subgroups are in fact cyclic uh, of order, the same order as, well, their, their relevant order. Okay, so... I now conclude inside my group that obeys this strange property that all of these Seeloff subgroups, which are we know unique, are all actually cyclic. Okay. Now I also know that the group is isomorphic to the direct product of all of these, so overall, putting all of this information together, what I can now write is that G is isomorphic to the cyclic group uh, of order P1 to the power of alpha 1, direct producted with the cyclic group of order p2 to the power of alpha 2, direct producted with all the way up to the cyclic group uh, of order ps to the power of alpha s here. Okay, so that's what I now know 
uh, to be true. Now, why does that imply that G is cyclic is the final question that we want to ask. Okay, because it does, but we need to understand why. Now, to understand why, all we need to do is introduce a little bit of notation for this. Okay, so first thing, let's just write G out explicitly. Let's write this structure out explicitly. Okay, now, obviously, this is only isomorphic to this, so the symbols here might be very different. Okay, but of course, uh, we could... Um, have a mapping uh, associating each of the symbols in G with an element over here, okay, and that would be, you know, a, just a relabeling mapping. It wouldn't change the algebraic structure, it would be an isomorphism, okay, so we can, if you like, uh, I will put isomorphic rather than equals, okay, more correctly. Okay, so let's write this out explicitly. So what is this going to consist of? It's going to consist of all S tuples of an element from here with an element from here all the way up to an element from here. Now, what do the elements in each of these look like? Well, they're going to be powers of their generators. So I'm going to need some notation for a generator. So we'll have the generator here as called A1. We'll have the generator here called A2. We'll go all the way up to here where we'll call the generator AS. So I hope you understand what I'm saying. This is the element, or this is the symbol I'm going to use for the generator here. This is the symbol I'm going to use for the generator here. This is the symbol I'm going to use for the generator here. All the elements here are going to look like a power of this. So I'll have it to a power, which I'll call beta1. And beta1 will be allowed to um, vary between being zero, in which case we're talking about the identity element, all the way up to it'll be allowed to be less than p1 to the power of alpha 1. Of course, p1 to the power of alpha 1 is equivalent to zero, which is why we don't want it to actually, we don't want it to bother actually equaling p1 to the power of alpha 1. Okay, and for here, we'll have a2 to the power of some beta 2, and what can beta 2 vary between? Again, it can vary between 0, and it can go all the way up to p2 to the power of alpha 2 here, okay, uh, etc. So, writing this now out, the elements here are going to be these ordered pairs of this form, a1 to the power of beta 1, a2 to the power of beta 2, all the way along to a s to the power of beta s, okay, where the beta i's can vary between 0 and they're strictly less than the p i to the power of alpha i, their relevant order here. Okay, right, so this is what this actually looks like. So this is identifiable, all the elements in capital G are identifiable with one of these s tuples here. Okay, so why is this structure a cyclic group? Okay, because of course if this is cyclic, then this is isomorphic to a cyclic group and is therefore cyclic. Why is this cyclic? Well, consider this element. I just need to find an element which generates the entire group. Okay, consider this element, a1, a2, all the way up to a, s. What is the order of that element? What is the lowest power that I would have to raise this element to in order to get the identity back again, i.e. a1 to the 0, a2 to the 0, all the way up to a s to the 0. This, by the way, is a1 to the power of 1, a2 to the power of 1, all the way up to a s to the power of 1. It's all the generators, basically. Okay, well, I would need everything to... Well, we know how composition works in here. We know it's just component-wise. Okay, so com composition is extremely simple. Okay, uh, and we would need everything to get up uh, well, what this means is that if I raise this to a power, so a1, a2, all the way up to a s, I was getting a little bit ahead of myself, so if I raise this to a power i, it's just going to be a1 to the power of i, a2 to the power of i, all the way along to a s to the power of i. Now, if we want all of these to equal the identities in each of these cyclic groups, which will give us the identity in the direct product, the product group here, okay, then we need all of these i's, well we need i to be a multiple of all of these powers that you have to raise each of them to in order to get the identity back again, the orders of each of these. So each of these generators has an order, a1 it has the order p1 to the power of alpha 1, a2 has order p2 to the power of alpha 2, all the way up to as having order ps to the power of alpha s. So we need i, in order to get this entire thing back to the identity, we need i to be a multiple of all of them. So we need it to be the least common multiple of, so I'll write this out, i needs to be the least common multiple of um, p1 to the power of alpha 1, p2 to the power of alpha 2, 
all the way up to uh, PS to the power of alpha s. Now hopefully it should be obvious to you that those are all relatively prime and therefore their highest common factor is equal to 1. Just look at their prime factorizations. They're already in their prime factorizations. Their highest common factor is clearly 1, therefore their lowest common multiple is just the product of all of them. So you'll need i to be equal to p1 to the power of alpha 1, p2 to the power of alpha 2, all the way up to ps to the power of alpha s before this will actually return to the identity element. So this, the order of the entire group, may I point out, is the order of this element where we have the generator in each of the slots. And therefore, this element, when you go through all of these different powers of it, must go through every possible element of this group on its journey to get back to the identity element or to get to the identity element. Okay, and that therefore is a generator of the entire direct product group here. Okay, and therefore this is cyclic of order p1 to the power of alpha 1, p2 to the power of alpha 2, all the way up to ps to the power of alpha s, which is of course just n, and therefore we can conclude that g is indeed isomorphic to the cyclic group of order n. Okay, so any finite group that obeys that funny property that for any little d which divides the order of the finite group, there is at most d solutions to the equation x to the d is equal to 1, uh, will be uh, cyclic. Okay, and we have clearly shown uh, that uh, a finite multiplicative subgroup of a field is going to obey that property, and therefore we can conclude that a finite multiplicative subgroup of a field is always isomorphic to a cyclic group of order, whatever the order of the group is. Thank you.